So at this point, I'd like to welcome up to, sta up to the stage Jeffrey Morad and Matthew Berry. And again, look at these seats that they get to sit on. It's I know, they're impressive. very close. You and I are going to like touch knees or something like that. I think I'd rather have the ESPN seat. Yeah. With all due respect to Morgan Lewis, right? Uh, so, Jeff, I'm, I'm just curious. So, you just heard Wayne's introduction, and Wayne could have actually spoken, I think, for another 20 minutes uh, about your bio. But I'm, I'm very curious. So, one of the, a couple of things that didn't come up that I don't think in, uh, in Wayne's intro, maybe not, is so, in addition to uh, being chairman of Morgan Lewis's Global Sports Industry Initiative and a principal of Morgan Lewis Consulting, you are currently managing a $300 million fund that invests in teams, leagues, and businesses in the sports ecosystem. You guys have closed two soccer deals recently in Europe, one in Portugal, one in Spain. And when we were talking backstage, one of the things you said to me was, you said, what we're looking for, really the kind of the primary driver of some of these things is sports IP. And I want you to sort of start there and talk to me about why why that thrust? Well, uh, first of all, thanks uh, to everyone uh, for at least listening for a few more minutes. Uh, yeah. It's been a great conference, by the way. It's been terrific. 76 uh, Capital's done a great job, right? You can give them a round of applause. That's allowed. I, Usually at 5 o'clock, everyone's heading to the bar, and they're all here still. So that's, uh, that's a uh, credit to the uh, conference organizers. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, look, uh, so we, uh, we have a fund which is focused on, on buying assets, uh, really teams, investing in teams, leagues, and businesses in the sports ecosystem. And, you know, it is true that kind of, you know, the common theme of all those investments tends to be sports IP. Um, what does that mean? It means that, you know, wherever the holders of that IP are in the industry, we're interested. Uh, often they're the teams because leagues are passed through entities. In some cases, they're the leagues themselves. Uh, you know, in you know some sports like motorsports, for example, or or other leagues, uh, you know, that hold the rights uh, up in at the central level. So our view is is that whether it's traditional media, whether it's streaming, whether it's social media. You know, the, the opportunities to monetize, which generally we refer to as sports IP, is where the value is in sports. And that's what ultimately drives franchise value, club value, even the value of those uh, individual leagues around the world. Give me an example of a deal that you guys have done recently that you felt really fit that, fit that criteria. Well, so we invested into a couple of... Uh, uh, second division soccer clubs in Europe. Of course, they call them football in Europe. But, right. Uh, you know, one in uh, uh, Madrid and the other uh, just outside Lisbon uh, in Portugal. And you know, the the approach, uh, which uh, is is part of a, a thesis that a platform of second division clubs in Europe makes sense to control together to run in a synergistic way such that you pick up business efficiency uh, between the clubs, but also in the player transfer market in Europe, you can create a bit of a minor league system, not all that different than a team like the Phillies or Major League Baseball teams have, where a minor league system doesn't really exist in Europe, so that we already have several big clubs, uh, the more traditional global clubs are interested in affiliating with us and our platform. And as we add to that platform over time and ultimately uh, aggregate six, maybe seven clubs across Europe, all in the second division, it's a model that's a little different than the traditional model, which is all about investing into a club, hoping that it gets to the first division. In our case, we're okay sitting in the second division if we get promoted, that's great, it's gravy. But the fact is, is that owning a piece of, of uh, a second division platform, in our view, is something that's a really interesting thing to do. It's a form of sports IP, to be frank. Yeah, and it's, what's interesting is hearing you talk is just sort of how you look at something 
differently that you that you saw an opportunity like we hadn't planned on talking about this but can you I think that's something that has been a hallmark of your career in terms of sort of seeing an opportunity and looking at it in a slightly different way like again we didn't really talk about that we were going to talk about this but I'll bring it up very quickly which is your role at Morgan Lewis and and sort of how you came to be working at Morgan Lewis is because you sort of saw what they were doing and you looked at it slightly differently. Well, I can't take a lot of credit for that. Uh, my partner, Steve Cohen, who's out here somewhere, uh, certainly knows more about uh, uh, such matters than me. But, uh, you know, look, I, I was educated as a lawyer many years ago and I practiced law for a minute uh, and uh, then moved into sports and uh, really never looked back until I ran into my law school classmate, Jamie McKeon, who's the chair of Morgan Lewis, uh, you know, sixth largest law firm in the world, uh, third largest in the U.S., 2,000 lawyers. Uh, you know, I like to tell the story. We represent 78 of the Fortune 100 companies. Sometimes I tell the next part, 13 of the top 20, 7 of the top 10. So it's a pretty impressive resume and yeah. it's not a hard way, if somebody wants to talk about a law firm, it's not a hard conversation to get into. So Jamie and I had dinner uh, several years ago, and, you know, I asked kind of what the firm did in sports, because, you know, I'd hired them over the years, and I'd, I still do. I still use them. Our fund actually uses Morgan Lewis as our uh, fund council. And, uh, and so I was talking to Jamie about the work that they did in the, in the sports industry. You know, we represent all the, the major leagues in the U.S. We've done 70-some-odd M&A transactions uh, in football and basketball and baseball over time. And, and, and I said, yeah, I said, I, I'm just, you know, kind of curious, like, you know, how you view it all. And she said, let me ask you this. I said, would you ever consider helping us brand that practice? I said, I don't know, do I have to be a lawyer again? Huh. She said, no, you don't. She said, you know, she said, we'll make you a partner. She said, but, you know, the truth is you don't have to practice law. I said, all right, keep talking. Right. She said, I'm interested. And, and it's, a, it's a fascinating opportunity for me. It's a fascinating platform to be around, you know, uh, unbelievably bright lawyers who help, you know, really people like you and me you know, navigate the sports industry. And, you know, they navigate business generally, but obviously I focus them on sports projects. And it's been a really, it's been a lot more fun than I expected. So for two and a half years, I've uh, chaired the sports practice in the firm. And uh, again, I don't do the work. I only help, uh, in some cases, attract the work. And in other cases, uh, I consult for free. So... But in, but in terms of building their sports practice, I think one of the things we were talking about is that they have a, you know, you mentioned they have, you know, the majority of the Fortune 500 companies, or the top 100 of the Fortune 500 companies, uh, and all of them touch sports in some way, shape, or form. They really do, and that's what I, I often get a kick out of, uh, you know, the partners. You know, I was at a partner retreat recently, and uh, a guy came up to me, he said, hey, by the way, said, I was working on a project. It was a financing project. You know, he said, I'm a finance lawyer in Chicago. I said, okay, got it. He said, you know, he said, I don't think this is really a sports project, but I thought I'd at least mention it to you. I said, well, all right, that's interesting. I said, well, what was it? He said, well, you know, it was a project involving a, a soccer club in Europe. I said, oh, really? What was the club? Well, it was FC Barcelona. Like, uh, that's a sports project. Yes, that's a sports project. <laughs> so, you know, look, I mean, the, good, the great thing about the firm is, you know, 32 global offices, uh, you know, we, we, you know, strong presence in Europe and Asia, obviously the U.S. and, you know, in the Middle East. And it's, uh, it's just a, it's a great platform to be able to watch business through. And for me, obviously, I'm watching the evolution of global business right before my eyes. And... And I'll tell you, I learn an awful lot from it every day. Well, let's see if we can learn uh, at least a little bit from it. As, sitting in your, in your seat, so I'm going to challenge you on that. So you said you, you're learning about the future of global sports business. Tell me something you've learned recently. You, you know, I think, I think the evolution of, of really of our industry, and for those of you who have been in it over time, you certainly will relate, 
Um, the fact that it's now so global in nature is, is stunning to me. One of my partners, a guy named Arnie Reese, uh, who uh, you know from ESPN days, you indeed. Uh, has been uh, uh, you know, a, a career-long participant in, in the sports media world. And one of the roles that he has today, uh, which is you know, literally uh, just kind of a fun role because he's German-born and uh, he's the chairman of the Bundesliga in North America. And, yeah, you say, what does that mean? Well, you know, he helped the Bundesliga do a deal with ESPN. So ESPN will be the, you know, exclusive uh, uh, broadcast partner of the Bundesliga uh, in North America, certainly in the U.S. going forward. And, uh, and, and Available for $5 a month on ESPN Plus. I'm a company man. So, um, but go ahead. Go ahead. So, I'm sorry. So it's Didn't mean to interrupt you for a plug. That, you know, we look, whether you're sitting in Philadelphia or New York or on the West Coast where I live primarily, or whether you're sitting somewhere else in the world, you know, look, our phones allow everything to be accessible. And for me, it's like if there's a, if there's a lesson in all of it, it's the fact that, you know, the phone is the absolute conduit to sports. By the way, it's, we're the one industry that everyone has to watch live. And that makes for a whole lot of distinction as you look at kind of what the future of sport looks. Not exactly what you asked, but I'll tell you, it's such an important theme, at least in my life and, and the way I view the world and view the industry today. It's like sp live sports content is going to continue to be a must-have asset. So why are we investing in sports IP, whether it's teams or leagues around the world? Because at the end of the day, you know, unlike everything else today, with the exception of maybe live news, uh, everything else you, you watch, you know, you stream it, right? You watch whenever you want to watch it, you know, with the exception of, you know, kind of, you know, waiting for the next episode of Succession, which you have to wait till 9 o'clock on Sunday for. The fact is, is... You know, you, you, you tap into whatever you want whenever you do. But live sports is, is a unique asset that's available, and it drives the industry that everyone here is focused on. And I think it's uh, really, really important to remember. There's no question about that. Uh, I'm curious, Jeff, uh, in terms of, so, you know, we talked about this $300 million fund that you were managing. Right, and we talked about the fact that basically, you know, generally you guys are investing in teams, leagues, and businesses in the sports ecosystem. And sports gambling is in the sports ecosystem. I've decided that. So I'm curious, what is your personal view on sort of sports gambling? How are you guys attacking this space? What are you looking at? Talk to me a little bit about the philosophy of the fund as it relates to sports gambling. So uh, once again, Arnie Reese, uh, who's uh, one of my partners in the fund, uh, is uh, is all he, he's chairman of a lot of things apparently because yeah. he's also chairman of the U.S. Growth Board for Sport Radar, which is a company which is you know kind of rolling into the U.S. It's a you know an unbelievably significant company, uh, Switzerland-based, uh, you know a data collection, you know a data company uh, focused in sports and. You know, uh, you know, often I talk to business people and they're like, oh, well, is this another startup? I said, uh, this is a company that was, uh, uh, that did a recap at a $2.1 billion valuation a year and a half ago. So it's a significant business. Uh, again, Europe has been their focus. We all know that sports betting evolved in Europe on a much quicker pace uh, than, uh, well, I, let me put it differently. Uh, evolved because it was legal in Europe for a, a long time. And now as it's become legalized uh, by the Supreme Court and as it rolls into each state across the country and becomes legal uh, state by state, um, there's, there's a huge opportunity in the U.S. Obviously, the U.S. leagues have all, as you've learned today, I sat in on a couple sessions and listened uh, and learned myself, uh, but you know, all the leagues are now, you know, they're on to it, right? Like, they get it. This is a, a real potential profit center uh, for sports. And some individual teams are already, 
uh, are already there. All the leagues have turned the corner now. And I think that as that's occurred, you know, as the sport radars of the world have, you know, are creating, uh, you know, a niche, uh, a brand that's meaningful. By the way, they're the official data providers of all the major leagues now in the U.S., uh, having signed up the NFL recently. Um, to me, uh, it, it's indicative of what's going on. Around that type of involvement and around that type of, of evolving part of the industry comes startups, comes new businesses, comes, you know, businesses that, you know, didn't even consider being involved in sports in the past and all of a sudden realize that they have unbelievable opportunities sitting in front of themselves. So, you know, look, the, the only thing I'd say is our fund is, uh, is, is sitting on the sidelines at the moment, um, but we're, we're taking a very deep look at sports betting. We think it's, you know, here to stay. We think it's going to be a, an unbelievably uh, significant business going forward. People, people suggest that it might be $150 billion a year in the U.S., that's a big industry. That is indeed a big industry. I'm no math major, but I was able to put that together in my head. That's, that's a lot of money. So, uh, so Jeff, I'm curious then. So you sit there. You're, we're, looking at the, we're looking at the sports gambling space. We're sitting on the sidelines right now, but we're studying it closely. We're sitting on $300 million. My guess is there's a lot of people uh, in the audience today or potentially watching this later that are like, you know, I have a startup. I have a business that could use some cash, whether wherever stage you are. So, you know, you and I have gotten to know each other just a little bit here at the conference, and I'll just say this. So, you got here, and you've been meeting with people, and you've been talking with people, but in the, um, in the short time that you and I have been spending time together talking about this pr presentation, I've seen two different people come up to you and pitch you I ideas. And... I would like to point out, for example, that neither one of those pitches was the Fantasy Life app, which, by the way, I'm currently raising money for, so feel free to talk to me afterward. Look, I'm a company man. But, Jeff, so I'm curious, uh, what is the advice you would give to anyone out there pitching you specifically and just in general? Because if you saw two pitches in an hour, I can't imagine what your day-to-day -day life is like. I'm sure you get pitched every day of your life. Give some pointers out here for people that are thinking about either pitching you or just in general. You know, look, I'll give some pointers that might be a little different than you expect. Okay. Uh, I represented athletes for 20 years and, uh, and had a, a terrific career. I enjoyed it immensely. Um, you know, my partner, uh, Lee Steinberg, and I represented the largest number of NFL players in the country for 18 years uh, together. Um, I had a baseball practice. I was fortunate enough to represent the second largest baseball practice in the U.S. Every one of those players that we represented uh, over the years required a pitch of their own. Sometimes you were pitching their parents. Sometimes it was their high school coach. Uh, sometimes it was their girlfriend or wife. But the fact is, is that Every one of those players required a pitch so that over the years, you know, the truth is, you know, my business career was probably assisted by the fact that I sat in living rooms of players around the country, whether it was, you know, Troy Aikman or Warren Moon or Pat Burrell here in Philadelphia. Um, you know, again, uh, you know, hundreds of players and pitched the idea of getting involved with them in a business context. So if you think about that and how it applies to the pitches that involve startups and new businesses and theories about getting involved, whether it's investing or whether it's you know becoming involved with a company, the truth is, is that it's the same type of sales. And to me, what that always required was being able to look people in the eye, being able to you know, transmit a feeling of confidence, but also deference and, and, the, and, a, and a willingness to learn. And, you know, not a presumptuous, uh, believe me, there are a lot of presumptuous people in the sports world and, you know, still are. I mean, it's, you know, it's a business, it's an industry that thrives on confidence. I mean, it's, you know, we all know that. It helps the athletes perform on the field. It helps, 
you know, the leaders that lead the club, uh, you know, perform at higher levels and, and even, even on the ownership side, uh, you know, there, even though there shouldn't be as much ego there as there is, there's a little ego there too. But the fact is, is that the advice I'd give is that it's about communication. It's about delivering a message in a concise way that people can relate to on the other side. I don't think it's a whole lot more, you know, involved or complicated than that. It's about, it's about messaging in a way that people can relate to and understand and remember. You know, my, we were talking about this before. My father is a college professor, uh, used to teach at UVA, so I was thrilled when I met Ralph Sampson. 12-year-old me was very excited about 10, 10 minutes ago. Uh, but, uh, and he, he's taught forever, and now he's a professor at Texas A&M. And the most important thing my dad ever taught me was communication, that it doesn't matter if you cure cancer, if you can't tell anyone about it and explain how you do it, it does no one any good. So he always, ex he always sort of uh, drilled into me that the most important thing, whatever you did in your life, it was important to, under to be able to communicate, communicate effectively, hopefully concisely, in an entertaining way, and so, I think that's amazing advice and not really um, one that gets given. It's just like, it's, it seems simple and obvious, but you'd be amazed at how many people don't. I, I've sat through my share of pitches as well of people that either want to do something with me or with ESPN or potentially, and you're just sort of like, how soon into a pitch? Because I always feel it's like it's 30, 45 seconds, a minute, where it's like, I get it. I'm either, I get it, and I'm interested, tell me more, or it's like, yeah, I get it, not for me. Right? Something like I that? I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, be direct. Be direct. Be direct, be concise, and just, you know, why would somebody be interested in this? Because if it takes long to explain, it's probably, probably got to refine the pitch. Uh, we have a lot of students in the audience. Jeff, I know this is something that's near and dear to your heart. Um, you, among the many things you do, you also teach a course. Uh, so for some of the students that are here in the, uh, in the audience, give me a piece of advice that uh, that you would tell them in terms of breaking into the industry or what's the one thing you wish you knew back then that you know now? You know, if I had to do it over again, I'd go to business school rather than law school. Sorry, Steve. Um, but, uh, you know, look, I, I always tell young people, and I teach 70 MBA students every year at UCLA at the Anderson School, Frankly, I learn more from them than they do from me. It's a terrific experience. I, I never thought I'd enjoy it so much. And you know, when we sold the Padres back in 2012, uh, the dean of the business school called and said, "Hey, would you have any interest in uh, in you know teaching a class on sports business?" I said, "You know what? I always wanted to go to business school, so actually, this might be the time I get to." And, uh, and so I jumped at it, and I've now done it for seven years, and you know, start my eighth in January. Only one class a year, but I get so much out of that. And I sit with my students, I actually take them to dinner. I have a you know, thing every, every week, up to 10 students can sign up for dinner, and you know, helps me miss traffic in LA, so it's not that big of a deal. But, um, but I love going to dinner with the students and kind of, you know, getting to know them better and asking them about their career aspirations. And probably half of them are in the class because they're, you know, international students and they're fascinated by the business in the U.S. And, uh, and they don't have any interest in necessarily getting into sports. But the other half want to get into the sports industry. And, you know, it's... It's tough because I know that as I'm talking to that, you know, group over time of call it 30, 35 students who are passionate about the sports industry, I know they're not all going to get involved because there just aren't the opportunities to do it. But what I tell every one of them is, you know, if you work hard, you continue to educate yourself, whether you're formally in school or whether you're, you know, learning on your own or whether you're learning while you're working for a sports industry company, a team, a league, a business in the industry, the fact is, is that, you know, continue to push yourself. Push yourself beyond what your peers are doing. I mean, how, how, how we succeeded in the agent business years ago 
you know, look, I walked away from it. I consider myself one of the luckier ones that got out, but I did it for 20 years. And we used to have a simple mantra, which is, we better work harder than the next guy. And by the way, they were mostly all guys back then, but it was, you know, it was to outwork people and to show ourselves as being better deserving of success than the next guy or the next firm. And the fact is, it's no different if you're trying to crack the sports industry. You have to distinguish yourself. Again, I'm speaking to the students, not to the people involved in the industry, but you have to distinguish yourself somehow, whether it's by education, whether it's by work experience, combination of the two. You have to be able to show yourself as being an overachiever and those are, the, those are the folks who I interviewed every day. When I was the CEO of the Diamondbacks in Arizona and the Padres in San Diego, as an example, and again, maybe this is a little you know, snobbish, but if somebody showed up with a joint JD MBA degree, I'd interview them every time. They didn't know that, but that was my rule of thumb. It's like you know, an aspiring law student you know, who wanted to be in sports, you know, I'd probably have them talk to my GC. A business school student, you know, who maybe was, you know, had, some, had a referral in or something of the sort. You know, look, I, they'd interview with the head of ticket sales or the head of sponsorship or corporate partnerships. But the fact is, is, you know, somebody distinguished themselves with a couple advanced degrees like that. I'm like, I want to meet that person because I want to see who they are and try to get a sense of, you know, somebody that works that hard, they deserve my attention. You know, that, I think that's a fascinating thing. Sometimes when I speak to students, I give similar advice in a slightly different way. I always say, the example is, is somebody calls you up and says, hey, I got two plane tickets to Vegas. We leave at midnight. Let's go. Who's the friend you're calling? right? I come to you and I say, I got two tickets to Vegas, right? You immediately think of somebody, or I know exactly who I'm calling I'm going to Vegas with, right? But then I say, like, up, oh, you just went to jail. You got to call someone to come get you. Who's, the, who's that friend you're calling, right? And it's probably a different person than the person you want to go to Vegas with, right? You have that friend uh, in your mind that you're like, this is something that can't be screwed up. If I'm in jail, I know exactly the one person I'm calling. And I'm always like, for a job, you want to be the person that gets called when you're in jail, that, that, you know what I mean? Like, and so I always say, like, get in wherever you can. Just get in the door. And then if you prove yourself and you outwork everyone and you're, just, you're really hard and you prove yourself as valuable to that organization, you will get more responsibility and quickly and you will move up. So I always say that. And the other thing I say very quickly is uh, that you never know. When I was in college, I mean, I currently make my living wearing makeup and talking about fake football on TV. That job did not exist when I was in college. The idea that you could make a living talking about fake football, and by the way, a good living, uh, is, um, was insane to me. And so I always, I tell my kids that are in college right now that in, the important thing is to learn to sort of basic skills, communication, punctuality, you know, um, hard work, work ethic, you know, teamwork, and that, and as your career takes you, you will find other opportunities because as we've talked about, we don't know what the future of, of sports holds, so there's gonna be a lot of opportunity. We're running out of time, so I want to ask um, one quick question here, uh, one last question. So you've, you've sold and bought a ton of companies earlier in your career. You, uh, you sold Athletes Direct. You sold uh, Pro Trade, which turned into Citizen Sports Network, to Yahoo. Uh, as somebody who has bought and sold many companies in your life, think back to those kind of those early sales of companies you started. What do you wish you knew then that you know now about acquisition? You know, for me, it's, it's all about context. Um, understanding context is what ultimately drives understanding and, and in turn, you know, can, can help motivate uh, uh, at the end of the day the proper valuation, the proper, you know, way to see the future uh, and to help a potential acquirer see the future value of a company. So. To me, I mean, listen, I, we all kind of muddle through at our own pace, and I certainly have done my own over time, but, you know, understanding context is probably the greatest tool I have at this stage of my career, and it doesn't mean I understand everything, I don't, but understanding the sports industry from the player side, from the ownership side, from the in, an investor standpoint, from 
uh, a legal standpoint, all of those things provide context for me. And they, you know, not only do I see much better today than, wh than when I was younger how integral the industry is, how it's not only a close industry, it's a relationship-driven industry, but it's also an industry that relies on, you know, the pieces of the industry rely on each other to survive. And I think the more and the quicker that you can understand context, the better you'll be able to transact business in this industry. You are the CEO of the Arizona Diamondbacks. You were a co-owner of the San Diego Padres. You represented athletes for 20 years. You've been on both sides of that negotiating table. I know we're running short on time, so just very quickly, I was curious if you had any advice for people, because there's obviously there's a lot of athletes here in terms of uh, advice you would have in terms of working with an athlete, what, what's the best approach for working with an athlete, and what would you hope to get out of it? So it's kind of an open-ended question, but I just want to, want to make sure we, we get an athlete question in there. So, um, so that'll be the last question, but I'm just curious in terms of your, your experience on both sides of the table regarding athletes and how you see the sports world today. Look, I'm one of the lucky guys. Uh, I had a chance to, uh, to work on the player side uh, at the highest level for you know, 20 years. We represented 25 quarterbacks in the NFL, and it doesn't get any more fun than that. All the representing baseball players was fun too. Um, but moving over to ownership, uh, you know, my goal was to make a move, uh, to move over to management before I turned 50, and I made it, barely. Um, but I made it. And for me, being able to experience both sides of the industry was a, a terrific thing and something that uh, you know, I'm forever grateful for, grateful for the opportunities that I had, frankly, on both sides of the table. Um, they're not as different as people think. They're not as different as each side thinks. The truth is, they, once again, those are pieces of the industry that rely on the other in order to survive. And as long as we all remember that, as long as the players' associations and owners as a group remember that, the fact is, um, you know, the industry is a pretty special place. And uh, I, uh, I thank you for a chance to be here today to just share a few thoughts. Jeff Borat, everyone. Thank you to 76 Capital. Thank you, Jeff.